So I have some, um, uh, you know, so I have, I have some show and tell items that I will refer to um, uh, as as I go through this. Um, but uh, but you know, really more than um, uh, instructing you about how to make any particular type of fermented food or beverage, um, uh, what I would like to do tonight is sort of back up and address the broader question: What is fermentation anyway? Why is it relevant to our lives? Why is it practiced so widely? And how does it transform food? Um, and I'm going to really try to keep keep myself uh, uh, short. Sometimes that's a challenge. Um, and uh, uh, because I'd like for it to be interactive, and I'm sure that people have come here um, uh, uh, with questions, and uh, I'd like to make sure we, we leave some time to uh, address some of those questions. Um, so broadly speaking, um, fermentation is the transformative action of microorganisms. Um, if you're a biologist, you might already be shaking your head. Biologists definitely understand fermentation to be something uh, both more specific and more broad than that. For a biologist, fermentation means the production of energy without oxygen, anaerobic metabolism. Um, um, the cells of our own bodies are, 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 are capable of, of our fermentation. So you don't have to be a microorganism to perform uh, fermentation. Most of the foods and beverages that we describe as fermented um, uh, you know, meet the biologist's criteria. Um, they, um, uh, they are anaerobic processes. For instance, um, you know, the production of beer from malted barley and hops is an anaerobic process that does not require oxygen. Um, the production of yogurt from milk is an anaerobic process that does not require oxygen. The production of sauerkraut from cabbage is an anaerobic process that does not require oxygen. But there are a handful of fermented foods and beverages that everybody refers to as fermented that do require oxygen. I call these the oxymoronic ferments. Um, some examples of this would be vinegar. Vinegar requires oxygen. It's uh, created from metabolized from alcohol by um, uh, aerobic bacteria called acetobacter, and they can only uh, uh, metabolize the alcohol into vinegar in the in the presence of oxygen, which is why alcoholic beverages are always bottled so securely to protect them from the oxygen that can turn them into vinegar. And that's also why when you have a mostly empty bottle of wine, after a few days, it doesn't taste as good. It gets a little sour edge because it's filled with oxygen. And so those acetobacter just start to convert the alcohol into carbon dioxide. I have another great example of an aerobic ferment uh, that we've been making in our class uh, here at Schumacher. Um, this is tempeh. This is an Indonesian style of fermenting soybeans. Um, uh, uh, what you're seeing is literally a mold. Yesterday, this was just a bag of uh, uh, soybeans and rice. Um, and today, is, it is a, a cohesive mat bound together by the mycelium of, uh, of, of a mold. Um, and so this needs oxygen. It's in a plastic bag. That's the form to hold humidity in there. But it's got little holes. We, you know, we, we just we went with a little poker and, and, and poked holes in it so that there would be adequate oxygen flowing in there so that this mold could, could grow. So anyway, you know, there are these um, uh, you know, oxymoronic ferments that do require oxygen. And so I prefer to work with this broader lay definition of fermentation, that it's the transformative action of microorganisms rather than simply the biology just sort of anaerobic uh, metabolism idea. The problem with just saying, well, fermentation is the transformative action of microorganisms is that, you know, as we all know from our home kitchens and the food that we inevitably discard, not every transformative action of microorganisms results in something delicious that we wish to put into our mouths. Um, and, uh, and we really don't describe rotten or spoiled food that's destined for the compost or the chickens or the landfill or whatever it is we do with it. Um, we, we don't describe that as fermented. We describe that as rotten or spoiled. And we reserve this word fermented to describe um, intentional or desirable microbial transformations. Um, but I would say, come, there, there's, if anyone wants to sit on the floor, there's lots of room uh, on the side and in the front. Um, I think that, you know, the fact that we all have uh, you know, regular experiences discarding rotten or spoiled food gives us a little bit of insight into the inevitability of microbial transformation of our food. Um, so 
you know, the real, what, we, what we now recognize, you know, living in a bacterial world um, um, is that, you know, all of the plants and all of the animal products that make up our food are populated by elaborate communities of microorganisms. And so, except in the case of food that is dried, in which case those microorganisms are deprived of the water that they need in order to be active, you know, microorganisms will inevitably transform our food. Um, and so, you know, really all around the world, millennia before anybody had any specific insights into, um, you know, different types of microorganisms, you know, people learned through observation and trial and error how they could guide the transformation of food. And the practice of fermentation amounts to manipulations of environmental conditions that we would now understand as having the effect of encouraging the growth of certain kinds of microorganisms while simultaneously discouraging the growth of other types of microorganisms. Um, so, for instance, just to illustrate this, um, uh, let's talk about fermenting vegetables. And, um, you know, this probably doesn't look like any sauerkraut you ever have seen or eaten. Um, you know, this is a mixed vegetable ferment. You know, sauerkraut is, is just this is sort of German word that describes a, you know, a broad tradition of fermenting cabbage and other vegetables. But, you know, really there's no vegetable that you couldn't ferment. And I always recommend fermenting vegetables as, you know, the ideal first fermentation project for anyone who's interested in fermentation because it's incredibly easy, um, it is absolutely safe, there is no case history anywhere in the world of people getting sick from fermenting vegetables, you don't need any special equipment, you can do it in jars that are already around um, uh, in, in, in your home, you don't need special starter cultures, there are lactic acid bacteria on you know, every plant growing on this earth. Um, uh, it's easy, it's fast, uh, you can enjoy results really quickly. But okay, let's just imagine, um, you know, you have a half of a cabbage. You, 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 you ate half of it for dinner, you have the other half left, it sits on your counter, there's no room in the refrigerator, your fermentation slowing device, so it's just out on the counter at room temperature. You have every intention of using it the next day in your dinner, you run into a friend, you don't end up going home for dinner, um, it sits there another day, um, oh, you're going to the earth talk the next day, so, so you don't have time to cook. You know, it sits there for a few days. The weather's hot and humid. It's not going to turn itself into sauerkraut. It's going to, like, eventually, molds are going to start to grow on it. Has anyone here ever had, like, molds grow on the, you know, leftover vegetable or partial vegetable? So, okay, this is not a, you know, a, a, that uncommon of experience. So, um, you know, it could sit there for a week or a month or a year. It's never going to turn itself into sauerkraut. And those molds in a really hot and humid environment could literally reduce a head of cabbage into a puddle of slime. Um, so, you know, the environmental manipulation for fermenting vegetables is simply to get them submerged under liquid. So, um, you know, here we actually, um, we actually haven't added any water to these vegetables. Like, we just use sort of salt and a little bit of, like, squeezing the vegetables to um, pull water out of the vegetables. Vegetables are all very watery. And so we got the vegetables submerged under their own liquid. And so that's what I mean by an environmental manipulation. So because it's submerged under liquid, it just doesn't have access to, to air. And so the molds can't grow except maybe on the surface, which is the vulnerable part of it. Um, um, and, and, and really, like almost all fermentation processes are that simple. They are just, you know, manipulations of environmental conditions that people figured out, you know, thousands of years ago, um, uh, you know, and, and, and figured out how to perpetuate. None of it is rocket science. You know, the problem is that, you know, since the emergence of microbiology 150 years ago, um, you know, we have begun to be, you know, we began to be brainwashed into this idea that bacteria are so dangerous. So at precisely the same time as all forms of food production were disappearing from people's lives and from, uh, you know, from our communities, we became terrified of bacteria. And so, you know, the number one question that I've heard through my years of, of teaching about fermentation is, you know, how can I be sure I'm getting good bacteria growing in there and not bad bacteria? Um, and, you know, we just all have been brainwashed to be so fearful of, of, of bacteria that it's just hard for us to believe that a process this simple um, you know, could, could, could be safe.
Let me talk a little bit about how fermentation transforms food. Um, what first got me interested in fermented foods as a child growing up in New York City was the flavor of fermentation. And fermentation creates strong flavors. And what I've learned from looking around in gourmet food stores is that almost all of the food that we celebrate, that we ship around the world, um, that we pay exorbitant prices for, you know, what you find in gourmet food stores are mostly products of fermentation. Um, you know, bread is all fermented, cheese is all fermented, olives all involve curing. Curing is this sort of like big general word that means any kind of, you know, post-harvest maturation of a food, or not even a food, I mean firewood has to be cured, I mean, you know, any kind of post-harvesting uh, maturation. Um, and most of the curing processes for olives involve, involve fermentation. Um, uh, cheeses are all fermented, cured meats involve fermentation. Um, chocolate is fermented, coffee is fermented, certain varieties of tea are fermented, vanilla is fermented, um, condiments, I mean either they're directly fermented as in soy sauce or fish sauce or else, um, uh, you know, as in most of the British and most of the American condiments and many condiments around the world rely upon vinegar, um, uh, which is a product of fermentation to, uh, to, to stabilize them. So fermentation creates strong flavors. Not every flavor produced by fermentation. Oh, and I keep forgetting to mention beer and wine, and uh, you know, alcoholic beverages are created by fermentation. Um, not everyone loves every flavor of fermentation. I mean, some of these strong flavors, they're kind of edgy. You know, they maybe remind some people of decomposition or, you know, they're kind of scary. So I think like che cheese is a food that I think many people can relate to this. So as my taste has evolved through my life, I love stinky, stinky cheese. And, you know, if the cheese is over in that corner of the room and I can smell it from here, that piques my interest. Uh, and I want to go over and check it out and probably taste it. And I'll bet not everyone in this room would share my, um, uh, you know, love of stinky, stinky cheeses. So just, just out of curiosity, like this is a self-selected group of people who came to, you know, talk about fermentation. How many of you would say that you share my passion for these stinky, stinky cheeses? Okay, I mean, pretty good. So maybe like 25%, you know, that, 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 that's pretty good. But anyway, so the other 75% of you kind of get this idea that like, you know, not every flavor of fermentation is so um, uh, accessible. I mean, you know, sometimes when I get a, a nice chunk of a very mature cheese and invite some friends over, like somebody will open the door and they'll make a face and they'll say, did something die in here? And like they would just, they would never think about putting that into their mouth. And, um, and the world is full of these like very strong flavored uh, fermented food. My co-teacher this week, uh, Eva, well, you know, came here from Sweden and uh, she, you know, she realized at the last minute she couldn't bring it, but she was gonna bring us some surströmming. It's this uh, Swedish uh, low salt fermented herring um, that in contemporary production, it's put in cans and the sign that it's ripe is when the can bulges. Um, <laughs> And, um, and, you know, it is just seriously stinky. It, it doesn't taste nearly as strong as it smells. It's actually really compelling. I mean, I, I mean I've, I've come to, to really enjoy that flavor. But, but anyway, the, the, you know, fermenta fermentation can create some very strong flavors. And even thinking about, like, the first time you tasted beer, the first time you tasted coffee, I mean, just most of us are not born loving all of these flavors, but we learn through acculturation to, uh, to, to, to like them. Um, so, so that's one way in which fermentation transforms food is flavor. Um, preservation, like this has just been a hugely important motivation for people to ferment food and to sort of figure out strategies for, um, for preservation. I mean, you know, our um, perspectives on food preservation in the 21st century are somewhat warped. I mean, we all, I'm guessing everyone in this room has a fermentation slowing device in their kitchen. That's what a refrigerator is. Um, you know, I mean, a hundred years ago, if we had, a, you know, a group of people from this area, you know, people would not have had refrigerators in their home. Uh, you know, in 2014, most households on planet Earth do not have a refrigerator in them. Um, um, so, you know, we can't even imagine how we would eat many of the foods that we eat. Think about milk. 
you know, the milk that we all grew up with is really a 20th century phenomenon in the more affluent parts of the world. And, you know, I, I mean, people who milked cows and goats have always been able to drink fresh milk, but everyone else has been drinking soured milk. Um, and in the English language, we have this great word that has rapidly become um, obsolete, and the word is clabber, clabbered milk. Um, and clabbered milk is just soured milk. You can't take milk from the supermarket that has been heat processed, pasteurized, um, and clabber it because there's no you know, intact indigenous population of bacteria to sour it. When our milk goes off, it's not sour, it's putrid. Um, but, um, but, you know, sour forms of milk include yogurt and kefir and, um, you know, lots of, you know, wonderful um, um, uh, um, uh, uh, forms of milk that people love. And cheese is all fermented milk. Cheese is even more stable. I mean, we're used to putting all these things in the refrigerator because we have a refrigerator. But, you know, when I meet people living on the, you know, on the margins of modern society without refrigerators, um, you know, they have a block of cheddar cheese, a block of salami, some mustard some, um, uh, you know, some, some um, uh, uh, yogurt. I mean, these are all things that actually are fairly stable, you know, even without a, a refrigerator. So, so um, uh, preservation has been a really important reason for fermentation. I mean, you know, we might think of, of uh, canning as an old form of food preservation, and, and that's having a little bit of a revival right now. But um, the, the, the technology of canning is, is almost exactly 200 years old. The, the patent was issued in 1812 um, uh, to this Frenchman, uh, Nicolas Apert. Uh, and in, in France, they still call canning apertization, um, um, you know, because they remember him as, as a national hero. So that's sort of the diametrical opposite of fermentation. That's the idea of sterilizing food um, uh, in a jar. Um, but, you know, other than refrigeration and canning, there's not that many other forms of food preservation. I mean, you can dry food and deprive the food of the, uh, the, the, the bacteria or the microorganisms on the food of the um, uh, water necessary to, uh, uh, for them to transform the food. And that's one way of stabilizing food. So, you know, dried fish, dried meat, dried fruit, dried grains and legumes. Um, so there's drying. There's heavy salting, like you know, salted pork, salted beef, um, and, and, and that basically, you, you salt the food so heavily that microorganisms can't grow, but then it's also unpalatable, so you have to soak the food in water in order to make it uh, palatable. And then other than that, fermentation has been you know, the way that people had to, to, to preserve food. Uh, many regions of the world, just human habitation never would have been possible if people hadn't had insights into, you know, how to, um, uh, uh, you know, use microbial transformation to make foods more stable. Um, so preservation has been another, you know, really important benefit of fermentation. What's getting many people interested in fermentation at the present moment is perceived health benefits. So I want to I want to address that a little bit. Um, and, you know, obviously foods as varied as, um, you know, coffee, salami, uh, sauerkraut, and yogurt do not all have precisely the same kinds of, um, you know, nutritional qualities. Um, but, the, but the process of fermentation transforms foods in some broad patterns of ways. Um, number one, I'll call pre-digestion. This is the idea that as the food is fermenting, microorganisms are, you know, digesting nutrients and breaking them down into simpler forms. I think that the food that really illustrates this more vividly than any other food would be the soybean, the humble soybean. Um, you know, the reason why the vegetarian subcultures of the West adopted soybeans as an almost singular replacement for meat and milk is that soybeans are considered to be the plant source food with the most concentrated protein. But you never really hear about people sitting down and eating a big bowl of soybeans for dinner. Um, and the reason is that they are utterly indigestible. Um, uh, you know, edamame, the immature soybeans are an exception to this. That's more like a vegetable. But once the soybeans are mature and you have those, the dry little yellow beans, you know, if you just cook them in, and eat a, a bowl of them for dinner, um, you know, it's going to just give you gas and indigestion and you're not going to be able to get the protein out of those soybeans. So the, you know, the Asian uh, uh, cultures, the pioneered soy agriculture, developed all of these different styles of fermenting the soybeans. So there's soy sauce, there's miso, there's natto, there's tempeh, there's lots of other variations of forms of fermented soybeans. Um, they have very different flavors, textures, uh, fermentation organisms, fermentation times. But what they all have in common is that the protein, the soy protein, gets broken down 
into amino acids, the building blocks of proteins. That's pre-digestion. Um, uh, lactose, the milk sugar that so many people have a hard time digesting, gets broken down by fermentation. Um, you know, even the gluten in wheat and some other grains gets broken down. Um, um, you know, not by yeast, but by a bacterial fermentation, by a mixed culture fermentation, what, what we call a, a sourdough. Um, so pre-digestion. Then the next way the food gets transformed is detoxification. It's really the same as pre-digestion, except instead of you know, pre-digesting nutritious compounds, it's the pre-digestion of toxic compounds. Um, during the fermentation. So, um, uh, you know, certain, certain um, uh, uh, toxins found in foods can be very dramatic. Um, um, uh, cassava grown in certain soils, notably in, not notably in West Africa, have, have really high levels of cyanide. And if people tried to eat unprocessed cassava roots there, they could kill them. And so, you know, the processing is basically they're, they're um, uh, uh, peeled, coarsely chopped, put in water, being in water initiates a, a fermentation that breaks down these cyanide compounds and makes the cassava safe to eat. Um, you know, many food toxins aren't quite so dramatic. Oxalic acid that's found in um, you know, rhubarb and spinach and certain other vegetables, that gets broken down by fermentation. Um, uh, phytic acid found in the outer layer of grains and legumes. Um, uh, and, and different kinds of seed foods. Uh, you know, that's a toxin that you could, I mean, probably many of you have been eating it for years without, you know, recognizing that it was a toxin. It's only, it's, what makes it toxic is that it binds with minerals and makes the minerals in the food um, uh, unavailable to you. So the, you know, fermentation breaks down those sort of phytate bonds with the, with the minerals and makes the minerals bioavailable and so removes that kind of a toxin. It's, there's even been some interesting research looking at pesticide residues on vegetables um, and they found that a residue of organic, uh, organophosphate uh, uh, pesticides on cabbages is, uh, uh, is broken down by fermentation. So there's lots of you know, detoxifying applications of fermentation. Um, you know, then there's what I would call um, uh, nutrient enhancement. Beyond the idea of breaking down what's in the food you start with, the ways in which fermentation can contribute additional nutrients. Almost all fermented foods have higher levels of B vitamins than the raw food that you start with. And this basically has to do with an accumulation of microbial bodies, living and or dead. Um, uh, you know, they, 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 they build B vitamins in the food. And then there are certain foods have, um, you know, what I would describe as unique micronutrients that are basically metabolic byproducts of specific organisms. Um, you know, fermented vegetables, you know, sauerkraut and, uh, you know, and related foods um, have, been have, have been found to contain compounds called isothiocyanates that were already being investigated by cancer researchers and were recognized as anti-carcinogenic compounds. Um, and they're generated by the lactic acid bacteria um, as they ferment the, the vegetables. Um, uh, natto, this is, this is natto. Natto is, is a Japanese ferment that's typically made with soybeans. This, this is a, a lentil version of natto. But natto has gotten a lot of attention um, um, for a compound that's been found in it um, uh, that's generally known as natto kinase. And you can find in vi vitamin supplement stores everywhere, you can find um, um, you know, supplements of, of, of natto kinase. And, um, uh, and, and natto kinase has been found to help uh, regulate blood clotting um, uh, and, and people with a variety of blood clotting disorders are, are using it. And, and, and it's also been shown to um, uh, dissolve a substance called fibrin. Um, and that's basically like the, the fibers that, that accumulate in your blood vessels and can constrict circulation and, and are a root cause of all sorts of uh, different disease processes. Um, but but, but, but natto, uh, natto kinase, this, this compound that, that's generated during this fermentation, um, has been found to um, uh, help dissolve the, those kinds of fiber accumulations. Um, you know, then what I would really consider to be the most profound nutritional benefit of fermented foods um, would be the live bacterial cultures themselves that are not found in every fermented food. Um, you know, for instance, uh, you know, tempeh is a mold ferment and typically it's cooked after it is produced. So when you eat, you know, beautiful fried tempeh, it's, it's delicious. You know, the, the protein is nice and bioavailable as a result of the fermentation. But 
it's not, um, uh, you, you know, there's no living bacterial cultures after it's been fried. You know, bread, if you want to eat raw sourdough dough, that's full of live cultures, but nobody really wants to eat raw dough. Um, and, and after it's been sitting in a hot oven, the live bacterial cultures die just from being at, at such high temperature. Um, so only certain foods really lend themselves to live culture uh, uh, consumption. But like, you know, um, uh, yogurt and kefir and other types of dairy products, um, you know, sauerkraut and other kinds of um, um, uh, uh, fermented vegetables, um, a huge variety of, uh, you know, what I would describe as lightly fermented uh, beverages. Um, you know, I would argue all traditional alcoholic beverages that were made with, um, uh, with, with, with broad communities of organisms rather than just yeast. Like what you have to understand is like yeast as a separate thing is an invention of Louis Pasteur 150 years ago. Um, you know, ye people have been working with yeast for, for 10,000 years and yeast is just a natural phenomenon that, you know, found on all fruit. Um, um, and, you know, I mean, animals and uh, birds and insects and, uh, you know, our evolutionary forebears have, you know, been, you know, periodically enjoying, um, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 fruit fermented by yeast um, uh, for who knows how long. Um, you know, we know from, you know, the, the archaeological record of pottery shards, you know, that there's been, you know, intentional fermentation in pottery vessels for at least 9,000 years. Um, um, but, you know, all of that was never just yeast. Like in, in the natural world, you never find singular microorganisms. Microorganisms exist in broad communities. Um, so, uh, uh, you know, so, so, so anyway, you know, all traditional alcoholic beverages also had lactic acid bacteria. But anyway, the significance of these bacteria, um, you know, wh why it's beneficial to us to eat foods live in bacteria is that we have been living all of our lives in the midst of the war on bacteria. And it's not just this indoctrination that I described earlier that, you know, you know, that we've been told and brainwashed to believe that just bacteria are bad, bacteria should be avoided, bacteria should be killed, bacteria should be eradicated. I mean, I've been seeing it around the UK, just like in the US, like if you go to the supermarket and look at the marketing of soaps, you know, there's really nothing more alluring that a soap manufacturer can write on the, on the soap container than promising you that it kills 99.9% .9 of bacteria. And we just have been, you know, kind of, we've been conditioned to sort of think that that's a beneficial thing. Um, you know, the reality is, you know, the 0.1% of bacteria that have the potential to make us sick um, you know, the biggest thing that protects us from them are the 99.9% .9 of bacteria that we, can, that we can coexist with perfectly well. And, you know, really nothing makes us more vulnerable to bacterial illness than continually killing off the bacteria, you know, on, around, and inside of our bodies. And yet, you know, the war on bacteria is also a chemical warfare. I mean, you know, these antibacterial cleansing products, soaps with triclosan in them, um, um, you know, antibiotics, which, you know, I mean, I'm not against the use of antibiotics. I probably wouldn't be here, you know, were it not for, you know, the, the miraculous um, uh, um, uh, 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 use of them. But, um, but everyone agrees that they're overused more than in the human population in healthcare, in agriculture. They are, they are more overused as a result of their overuse in healthcare and in agriculture. They're building up in our water table. So we're all drinking water that has low levels of antibiotics all the time. And the other thing that's found in our water is chlorine. That's another chemical designed to kill bacteria um, uh, and, and, and used for that. So we just have this, we have this constant exposure to all these chemicals that kill bacteria and it is having repercussions in the, for, for the you know, um, uh, elaborate community of bacteria that we depend on. So, you know, contrary to our, you know, indoctrination that bacteria are so, you know, awful, we could not live without bacteria. I mean, our bacterial um, communities in, in our gut in particular, but really all over the surfaces of our bodies and, and in every part of our bodies, um, they outnumber our bodily cells. Ten years ago, biologists came to the conclusion that the cells that we each possess that reflect our own unique individual DNA code are outnumbered 10 to 1 by bacteria that we're host to. And these bacteria are not, you know, they're not parasites. They're not freeloaders. They give us our functionality. Um, you know, they enable us to digest food and assimilate nutrients. They synthesize essential nutrients for us so we don't have to find them in our food. What we call our immune system is largely the work of bacteria. 
uh, uh, in our uh, uh, intestines. Um, in the last couple of years, this, there's all this amazing new information about how bacteria relate to mental health. And it turns out that you know, the, the regulation of serotonin and other kinds of chemical compounds that determine you know, how we feel and how we think are, are, are regulated by, by bacteria. So you know, all these different aspects of our, of our, of our physiology, our functionality, you know, and probably more, um, are related to the health of the microbial communities in our gut. And yet we have all this you know, chemical exposure to, back to um, uh, you know, chemicals that are you know, killing off populations of bacteria in our gut. So I would say that you know, for us in the 21st century, more than for people in the past, we need to be thinking about consciously replenishing these bacterial communities. One way people do this is with little capsules, probiotics. But really, I mean, traditional fermented foods have much broader communities of bacteria than you know any of the little capsules do. Um, uh, you know, and, and uh, you know, I, I have you know come to firmly believe that um, uh, you know these traditional foods are um, you know very effective ways of um, you know rebuilding biodiversity in our uh, in our intestines. Um, let me just talk about a couple of fermentation concepts and, 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 and describe uh, uh, some of these things go going on here. Uh, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up and, and see if anyone has um, any burning issues they want to talk about. Um, so the title of my uh, first book about fermentation, which was published in 2003, uh, was Wild Fermentation. Um, I wish I could claim credit for making up this expression, but it's found throughout the literature and it means something specific. Um, wild fermentation is fermentation that's based on organisms that are spontaneously present on the food that you're fermenting. So, you know, sauerkraut and other forms of fermented vegetables are almo almost always made as wild fermentations, you know, because there are lactic acid bacteria, you know, on all plants. It's just, it's easy to do it that way. There's really no need to, um, uh, you know, add any kind of a starter culture, although there are lots of people who will be happy to sell you one. Um, um, so, they, you know, they are commercially available, but, you know, they're, they're just utterly unnecessary. Um, you know, conceptually, every fermented food had to start as a wild fermentation phenomenon somewhere, right? I mean, so if you want to make yogurt, you know, you need to get a starter to make yogurt, but, you know, the first person who made yogurt didn't have anywhere where they could go to get a starter. Um, so, so, you know, uh, because yogurt involves thermophilic bacteria that are only active at elevated temperatures, you know, roughly above body temperature. Um, uh, you know, we can, we can sort of, we can surmise that the first yogurt happened on a really hot summer day um, uh, in a, you know, in a really hot place. And, the, you know, the region where it emanates from is, you know, kind of the eastern shore of the Mediterranean. And, um, um, uh, but, but anyway, we don't really know the origins of any fermented foods. Like, they are all, they are all prehistoric. They, they, they're, they're all so ancient that, that, you know, we can only speculate about, about the origins of, of them. Um, and, um, and there are various ideas that have developed about, about starters. So the oldest kind of starter, like the way that people use to, 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 to propagate yogurt, is um, uh, something that we have a great, uh, 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 um, uh, a vivid expression for in the English language, and that is backslopping. So you take a little bit of the old batch and you introduce it into the next batch. And then you save a little bit of that one, you don't use it all, and you introduce it into the next one. Um, today in our class, we were working with sourdough. Um, you start a sourdough as a wild fermentation. Everything you need is really on, uh, on every grain. But you know, once you have a nice, you know, vigorous sourdough with nice flavor, you propagate it. You, you never bake all of your dough. You always save a little bit of it back and introduce it into some new flour and water and that becomes your starter. So, so backslopping, that's really you know, the oldest form of you know, propagating um, 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 a, a culture and um, 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 uh, you know, sort of keeping it going over a long period of time. You know, then there are the laboratory-derived uh, uh, starter cultures. Um, you know, the, the packet of yeast that you can buy in any supermarket. You can go to, any, you can go to a brewing supply store and buy these more, more specialized strains of yeast that are selected for their tolerance to alcohol or different kinds of um, um, uh, flavor uh, uh, characteristics. Um, 
you can go to more specialized uh, 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 catalogs and buy the starters for various kinds of cheeses. You know, you could buy the mold to make a blue cheese. And then if you could simulate the environment by, you know, to, to, by rigging up a, a, a refrigerator to stay at a certain temperature and a certain humidity, you know, you could buy the culture and make the cheese. And so, you know, we've taken a food, food that, you know, really evolved in very particular places, um, um, uh, you know, because of very specific conditions and made it possible to, 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 to make them uh, uh, anywhere. This, um, you know, this, this tempeh was made with a, a, a pure culture starter of a, of a mold called Rhizopus oligosporus that was um, uh, propagated in Belgium and, um, you know, sent through the mail. Um, and we were able to buy it and, 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 and make this, you know, Indonesian food that, you know, at, at some point in the past in, 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 you know, on the island of Java, it was made as a, as a wild fermentation, but the way it's sort of propagated, um, you know, for, for international use is, uh, you know, through laboratory-derived cultures. And these have only really been possible for the last 150 years. The third style of, um, of starter, which, which I think is just especially fascinating, is, um, is something that's called a SCOBY. S-C-O-B-Y is what they're called generically. And that stands for Symbiotic Communities of Bacteria uh, and, and Yeast. And, um, and what this here is is, is, is kefir. And um, the SCOBYs are these, um, you know, communities of, of organisms that have evolved into distinctive physical forms. Um, and the, so this, uh, the, 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 these are called kefir grains. And they're like these little rubbery blobs that look something like uh, florets of cauliflower. Um, and each of these blobs um, is the home to an elaborate microbial community. In this case, it's more than 30 distinct uh, uh, microbial strains that have been uh, identified that, um, you know, they have evolved, uh, uh, you know, into this symbiotic arrangement where they coordinate their reproduction, they spin the skin that they share, um, and, um, and you just like plop these into milk, room temperature, shake it around a little bit, leave it for 24 or 48 hours, they ferment the milk, and then in the course of that, these little granules grow. There's other examples of scobies. There's one that's um, you know, been popular for some time uh, in Britain that's called a ginger beer plant. Um, uh, that's, you know, they, they look different than, than this, but they're these like kind of little rubbery things that you put in some, you know, um, uh, um, sugary ginger flavored water, or you really can put them in, uh, in other flavors of sugary water and, and they'll ferment it. And they're these symbiotic communities of bacteria and yeast. I'm sure some of you have, have, have tried kombucha. Um, it's basically a, a sweet tea that's fermented. Um, and, the, and, and the scoby for that is, mo is often called the mother of kombucha. And it's basically, it looks like a pancake, like a rubbery pancake. And it just floats on top of the sweet tea um, and, 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 and ferments it. Um, but you know, these are, these are of special interest to evolutionary biologists because um, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, people have tried to create these in laboratories and no one's been able to do it. You know, you could have all the right individual microbial strains and, you know, put them together in a test tube like a mad scientist, but you can't really just get them to grow together like this. Um, so, um, you know, but because people have been, um, uh, you know, domesticated animals for their milk for a relatively, you know, limited period of time, um, uh, you know, these, these are an example of evolution that's occurred in a fairly limited uh, period of time. Um, so I'm going to pass these around for any, any, anyone who just wants to take a look at them. Please don't eat them. I mean, they'd be, you'd be fine if you ate them. It's just, um, I once passed them around at a demo and they were, and they just all disappeared and people, <laughs> thought, people thought they were supposed to eat them. So, um, um, you know, I, they're, they're for everyone to get to look at. Um, but, you know, we want to return them to, um, uh, to, to the project. Um, I'm going to say one other thing, and I just want to sort of sh see, I think on this one it's kind of visible. So this is, these are basically just beets and uh, maybe garlic, uh, uh, just, and a little bit of salt in, a, in, in, in water, like in a saltwater brine. And there's tiny little bubbles all around the edges. Um, 
you'll see that there, you'll see, you can see that there's like a little, there's a little um, puddle around this one um, uh, because it was so active that, you know, what, while it sat here for a half an hour, um, the carbon dioxide like lifted it up and it sort of spilt out of here a little bit. Um, so bubbles, bubbles are really what have always defined fermentation. And, I, and in fact, the word fermentation comes from the Latin word fervere, which means to boil. The word yeast comes from the Greek word zestos, which means to boil. And it's because you know, fermentation was always recognized by its visible action. Um, and that's been bubbles. Um, and, you know, there's all sorts of indigenous cultures around the world that have had elaborate, you know, sort of ritual, you know, like a, a, around the process of fermentation. And, you know, in some places they felt that, you know, they needed to, to teach the liquid how to start dancing, how, 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 to, get all, uh, how to get all bubbly. Um, you know, we call these little, you know, communities of organisms, you know, let's say, you know, what you're introducing into the milk to turn it into yogurt, we call these cultures. I mean, I think it's fascinating that we use the same word culture to describe, um, you know, both uh, these little communities of bacteria and also to describe our, you know, language and music and literature and scientific knowledge and belief systems and practices and, you know, the totality of all the things that we seek to pass down from generation to generation. And I would just argue that as a, as, as a group, these fermented foods are more than incidental culinary novelties. And, you know, they're very, very centrally important to, uh, uh, you know, to culture. The word culture derives from the word for cultivation. Um, and agriculture wouldn't be possible without fermentation. I mean, how could people ever have begun to invest their energy and land and resources into crops that are ready at a certain moment of the year if they didn't have some, you know, effective strategies for preserving them? And, uh, you know, and, and, and we know that, you know, the most effective strategies for preserving food have been, have been fermentation. I mean, you can be a hunter-gatherer and spend each day procuring the food resources to get you through that day without having to think too hard about, you know, how food transforms over time. But if you're going to invest your energy into these crops that are ready at a certain moment of the year, you'd better have some insight into, you know, how you can effectively preserve them. Um, uh, you know, from surviving indigenous cultures that have, uh, you know, sort of ritual organized around fermentation, you know, to some of the major world religions where, um, uh, you know, products of fermentation like remain firmly embedded in our, you know, religious iconography. There, there just remains this, you know, cultural importance of, of these foods. I do not have encyclopedic knowledge of every culinary tradition around the world, but I've been looking really hard for a counterexample, and I cannot find any examples of cultures that do not, uh, culinary traditions that do not incorporate fermentation. And I basically have come to the conclusion that it's just, it's just not possible, except, except in, the, in the case of people who are procuring the food to get them through each day that day. Um, and, you know, it just seems like there's this inevitability to microbial transformation and in every part of the world people have devised strategies for, um, for working with that so that rather than microorganisms, you know, decomposing their food into something that is, you know, not at all appealing, they could sort of harness this natural force. Uh, you know, in order to make their food more stable, make their food more digestible, and make their food more delicious. Um, so I will, oh no, I'm going to say one more thing and then I'm going to end it. Um, so, um, uh, you know, we also work with this metaphorical um, understanding of fermentation. So sometimes you'll hear people reference um, a period of, uh, of cultural ferment, political ferment, social ferment, um, uh, um, you know, intellectual ferment, uh, spiritual ferment, and, and really this has to do with the same like bubbly quality except in a metaphorical sense because, you know, when people get excited about ideas, they get bubbly, like they want to share them. Um, they want to talk about them. And so, you know, I'll just leave you with this thought that like in addition to being this important mode of transformation for foods and beverages, you know, fermentation is no less important as an engine for social change.